of this nice conference to uh, invite me here and to give me the chance to put the talk. And I'm grateful to the audience to be still around on this practically last day of the conference. The um, title of my talk has been mentioned. And <clears throat> I could have also called this um, topic uh, frustration and fun with staggered vertex models. And uh, you will see this frustration, maybe also now some fun. Okay. This is the outline of my talk. I will be talking about the Staget spin one half Heisenberg chain that had been introduced already by Sascha German uh, two or three days ago. And I will build on all the material that's in my introduction to this system will be rather brief. Um, time permitting, I will also enter the problem of the so-called three bar network model with supersymmetry as a Two slash one. Uh, in, in general, the plan of my talk I mean, the, um, um, is uh, regarding the, the length of the talk. I will finish whenever my material will be exhausted or the time will be exhausted, whatever comes first. And, uh, I hope I can make it until here. So, in the course of my talk, I will um, remind you of the uh, phenomenon of continuously varying scaling dimensions or critical exponents in this staggered spin one half Heisenberg chain. I will introduce the TQ equation and data ansatz equations for that. And the goal is to analytically reformulate the TQ equation in terms of nonlinear integral equations with four functions. Uh, there's various different ways to do it. And depending on how you do it, you might experience a kernel of a kernel which is singular in a certain way or regular. Actually, there are more singular versions than regular versions um, and uh, we have to work a little bit to get the optimal formulation for it. Actually, I will use both formulations um, an optimal regular kernel and will present numerical results for systems of size 2 or 10, 10 to the 3, 10 to the 6, 10 to the 9, 10 to the 12, 10 to the 15, and then somehow the numerical accuracy will suffer a little bit, you will see. The singular kernel version of the integral equations is not absolutely useful because this allows to derive the asymptotic behavior of the energies. So we get the scaling dimensions, the 1 over L correction terms, but also the 1 over L times 1 over log uh, L squared terms analytically from the um, nonlinear integral equations in the singular kernel form just from the asymptotics of the function. So we never have to calculate analytically solutions to these nonlinear integral equations in order <coughs> to get the asymptotic behavior. Okay, um, yeah. The work is um, done in collaboration, has been done in collaboration with Mutsin Azari. So our, um, how to say, work to share is um, we, we developed the, the ideas which algorithm or which formulation to use and he tested it in Maple and once it was clear what to use, I wrote my own Fortran program, Fortran 77. <laughs> and I used my, my old Lenovo ThinkPad or whatever computer, almost 10 years of age. Uh, my computer is called WPNB153. I like my computer very much. And uh, okay, I will tell you more about it a bit later. Um, okay, here's the Hamiltonian. So Jacques German, he explained many things about it. Uh, you will see the anisotropy parameter gamma. Um, and you see nearest neighbor and next nearest neighbor interactions. Um, what you don't see is the parameter alpha. Here. I took the value alpha equal pi over 2, so to say the extreme value. And on this and maybe the more general model, there's a lot of work. And um, some of the authors of these papers are in the audience. So maybe the first work was done by. Jacobson-Saleur, Ecliffe-Jacobson-Saleur, 
and they found a non-compact continuum limit. They um, identified the leading block corrections. The various methods, numerically and also being off techniques, found in Martins for this model and other models, derived density function in a phase diagram, and found numerical solutions to the beta and such equations and uh, developed the physical picture. Now comes um, the core of my, my talk and uh, papers absolutely relevant for that namely um, nonlinear integral equations that were derived and numeric numer numerically, et cetera, solved by Kandu Iklev in 2013 and by Fram and Seel the same year. And um, uh, I will talk about that in more detail in a few minutes. The finding is we have a conformal spectrum. The energy of any excited state um, in the lower part of the spectrum consists of the bulk term, a pure bulk term, and then 2 pi over L times the velocity, times now several terms. Minus 1 over 6 tells us that the central charge is 2. Then come um, various terms with integers. M, the magnetization, if you change the magnetization from 0, then you add to, to some value M. M takes values plus minus 1, plus minus 2. Then you get um, a conformal dimension this is an additive contribution of this type, anisotropy gamma divided by 2 pi times m square, the integer square. There's another term, w. w is the reallocation of, um, let's say, beta and that's numbers from left to right, or let's say, excit excitations from one Fermi point to the other. And that's measured by w, and that adds another energy. And then come ah, this, these integers, non-negative non integers, they correspond to the tower, to the conformal tower. And the um, correction term, the finite size correction to the conformal weights, uh, is written here as 2 gamma over pi minus 2 gamma times s square. And s is practically a continuously varying number for a finite system, L. It is still quantized, namely in units of 1 over log L. But for large systems, this term here is practically continuous. It uh, shows a continuous variation of these conformal <coughs> weights. OK. I, yeah. Um, this, this term um, appears when you reallocate um, beta roots from left to right, from one firm point to another, but from one distribution line to another distribution line. And it's values, yeah? Um, how could be that energy is not periodic in gamma? So gamma, gamma appears in a Hamiltonian with the sinus. So gamma is, in that formula, gamma is restricted to some interval? Um, so here appears gamma, and um, gamma appears in E0 and in these finite size quantity. Yeah, yeah, I, I say, Hamiltonian uh, uh, is periodic function of gamma. Ah, yeah, so, OK. Um, here it's not. I mean, that's a usual phenomenon. You go into the large volume limit. Yeah, you, you perform, actually, a certain limit. And then when you do another limit, let's say you, you move gamma around by 2 pi or something like that, then you do not observe this behavior anymore. It's a, it's a non-interchangeability problem. I mean, this here is actually, these results here, they are, so to say, derived in a certain limit, and then you do not have access anymore to the periodicity uh, of the initial problem as function maybe, of gamma. you recall the phase diagram shown by Sascha. Mm -hmm. uh, the, this is only the conform set in one phase of the system, which is between gamma equals 0 and gamma equals okay. pi over 2. Good, good, good. Yeah. Good. Right, this, um, the loss of this property is phase transition. Indeed. Uh, the leading behavior of this um, number s is um, uh, yeah, proportional to 1 over log L. And uh, the number of reallocations from one line to another enter as a multiplicative factor. OK, um, that has been derived uh, in hop techniques by um, Iqbal, um, uh, Jacobson, Salur. And in 2019, a, fant a fantastically accurate quantization condition for S 
is valid even for relatively short chains has been derived by Bajanov, Kotovsov, Koval, and Lukyanov. And the entire picture that we have nowadays available is of the, um, the density of states in, in this model um, is not that of a certain nonlinear sigma model on a Euclidean black hole, but on a Lorentzian black hole. Sasha German said enough about that. Anyway, if you want to know more about it, don't ask me, ask him. <laughs> um, okay, what we want to do is, Mutsin um, Azari and I, we want to derive these numbers for arbitrary value of L, exactly. For that, we have to start with the integrability properties. Um, the eigenvalues of the Hamiltonian are uh, derived from the eigenvalues of a certain transform matrix. The basic transform matrix has eigenvalue lambda. For the staggered model, um, we need a product of these numbers at different points. But for the moment, it's enough to look at um, the, uh, let's say, eigenvalue of this lambda and the of this transfer matrix I did not introduce, which uh, was touched by Sasha German, that has this expression, TQ-like expression. Um, lambda times Q is a sum of phi Q plus phi Q. So um, uh, if you call lambda T, then this is a TQ equation. Phi is just the edge power of the hyperbolic sign. Q is a product of hyperbolic signs of one half the argument <laughs> that minus beta root ZJ. Um, we know, of course, that um, these, these roots have to satisfy certain conditions in order to have this function being analytic. It comes as the sum of meromorphic terms, and uh, we have to have pole pencil. And these are the beta and that's equations. <coughs> um, please notice, here is a power of hyperbolic sine and a not hyperbolic sine of argument divided by two. Therefore, the um, periodicity of the phi function is pi i, of the q function is 2 pi i. And here is shown the distribution of the uh, roots, the zeros of the q function in the complex plane. Periodicity is um, 2 pi i, and these roots are distributed at uh, plus and minus pi i over 2. The zeros of the eigenvalue function lambda are placed closely to the real axis and closely to the axis with imaginary part plus minus pi i. Um, we will be using this qualitative picture and um, use the fact that between these lines, so there are, two, there are two regions in the complex plane. So to say inner one and outer one for the uh, q function and uh, for the lambda functions an upper and lower part where there are no zeros. So that's a region where the logarithm of this function is analytic, has no logarithmic similarity. And that holds true even when we reallocate certain roots from the lower line to the upper line or vice versa. Now, what do we have to do? Usually, people introduce a counting function so they look at um, the ratio of the <coughs> terms on the right hand side of the TQ relation and have to demand that this ratio turns minus one at the beta root zj. We will be using this function. Uh, let us abbreviate it with a little a, a like auxiliary function. So we don't use this function a of z on the lines with imaginary part plus minus pi I, pi over 2, we use this function um, of these lines. Um, that's the core of this approach. And um, we introduced such an approach, I mean, we means me, bachelor, peers, I mean, first me, bachelor, and then bachelor, peers, and myself uh, in 1991, uh, and uh, later, uh, this in 92, etc., and in 98 appeared and, and used something like that, and since then these equations that are derived are called DDV equations. Well, that's life. Now, um, let me 
apply this approach to this problem here. We take this function, this auxiliary function A of Z, and we investigate it on straight lines that go through zeros and poles of the function phi. So we look at um, the real axis shifted by minus i gamma, and then this function A of x minus i gamma for real values of x is called A3 of x. For the case um, real axis plus i gamma, we hit a pole, and then we look at the reciprocal of this function and call this A1. And then there are similar such cases where the function phi, had, uh, where we hit uh, zeros of the function phi, or poles of the function phi of high order, namely of order L, um, shifted lines by pi i. So um, I introduce a 1, a 2, and when you add pi i here, then we call that function, oh, there's a, okay, so then we call that a 2, and um, a 4 is a 1 uh, plus pi i. So I'm, somehow I dropped it, I'm sorry. Or you could say, in mathematical terminology, it's convenient to consider. So we look at a1, a2, a3, a4 um, on, for real values of x, defined in terms of this master function little a. And we get the factorization in terms of phi and q. I mean, I just use the definition of the function a and write it down on the right-hand side. Everything is trivial so far. Now, we want to consider these functions a1, 2, a3 as exponentials of some energy divided by temperature, let's say. And we expect or driving at deriving integral equations of the TBA type. Namely, on the left hand side we have the energy, and on the right hand side bare energy, and then, convolution term, and then a log of one plus exponential of the energy. Of course, if um, you call this exponential of the energy divided by t little a, then what is written here is one plus little a. So we must be interested in the functions little a and one plus little a. And we're interested in the logs of that. So the logarithms of little a and the log of one plus a behave completely differently. Yeah, here is the list of the one plus a1, one, one plus a2, one plus a3, one plus a4 functions. We call them capital A1, etc., for brevity. And of course, since Little, the little a's are the ratios of the second to the first, or first to the second term in the QQ equation, then these ratios plus one in the factorization must spit out a factor which is just the eigenvalue function, and then multiply it with phi's and q's. Okay, so that's it, and now we do just functional analysis. We have equations or definitions of this type. On the left-hand side, some f. On the right-hand side, the product or ratio of function g and h, but with shifts. Now, if these functions, g and h, are analytic in a sufficiently broad regime, then the, this equation can, can be turned into a linear equation for the full transforms of the logarithmic derivatives of the functions f, g, h without shifts. Okay, step by step. Having this, we take the logarithm. Then we get an additive or linear structure. Then we want to apply Fourier transform. In order to be allowed to do that, we have to take the derivative because the logs of, let's say, hyperbolic sine is not Fourier transformable. The hyperbolic sine grows exponentially. The logarithm uh, will grow linearly. The derivative will be constant. And to be absolutely sure, we take the second derivative, if you want. And then we apply the Fourier transform of, to the, for instance, the um, logarithmic derivative of g with this shift i alpha. But this shift in the function then leads only to a multiplicative factor to the Fourier transform of the logarithmic derivative of the function g without shift. And then this equation <coughs> turns it into a linear equation for the uh, Fourier transforms of these functions. And what we have is we have four equations of the type capital A, 
sub 1, capital A, sub 2, etc. And on the right hand side appear ratios and products of Q and lambda. Notice the function Q and lambda have two different regions of analyticity. So there are two different Fourier transforms. So we have four equations, linear equations, where two different Fourier transforms of Q and two different Fourier transforms of lambda appear. And that can be solved, of course, in terms of these Fourier transforms of Q and lambda. And then we take these um, explicit expressions for the full transforms of the Q and the two different regimes and insert it into the definitions of the little a's. And there they are, the uh, integral equations. By the way, the calculation is really very short, so just to, to check if my calculations of the formulas were correct at the airport when I was waiting for my flight, I took the definitions and then I rewrote them carefully taking into account in which region the Q function, the lambda function, has to be evaluated, fits on one page. When I arrived by plane, was sitting in the train, I typed this into my computer in the WPP153 by use of uh, Maple, not Mathematica, and then these calculations were done. And indeed, yeah, there they are, these integral equations. These, let me explain what is written here. There are two ways to understand it. On the left-hand side are the logarithms of the little a functions. On the right-hand side appear the logarithm of capital A functions. Um, view this as a short form for the um, Fourier transforms of these functions. So think in terms of the Fourier transforms of these functions. On the right-hand side appear the Fourier transform of this little d, which is explicitly given here that appears in these calculations. And then comes a product of a four times four matrix, K, where capital K is a function of little k, the momentum of the um, use as a momentum mm -hmm. argument in the Fourier transform, and multiplied with the Fourier transforms of say, <laughs> well, use the Fourier transform to this equation for the Fourier coefficients, and then we get the functions log little a as functions of x, d is this here, and then capital K turns, uh, so the product turns into K star, where star is a convolution into. Now what is um, nice, what is difficult about this equation? The explicit kernel, the so four times four matrix, as a function of little k, is given here. It has block structure. So far, so good. Sigma one, and sigma one transpose are related by the usual transpose. So it's a two times two matrix. This is a transpose of the two times two matrix. Here in the upper right corner, it's two times two matrix. And in the lower corner, this matrix appears where the diagonal elements have to be interchanged. So I only need to write down sigma one, sigma two. Here are the matrices, and these are the common prefactors. And you notice that there is a disaster. There is a pole of second order for k equal to zero because there is a product of two hyperbolic sine functions in the denominator. If you make sense of that, then the Fourier transform of that is a function which grows linearly to the left and to the right. It's positive and negative slope. So it's not, not really a linear function, but it's, so to say, absolute value of x or constant times this x. So it's difficult. So you may wonder if this convolution really exists, but it does exist. Uh, it's maybe easier to think in terms of um, Fourier transforms. Yeah. Why can't you just like by hand subtract this part from the kernel, the singular part, and then add it as an extra term to the right-hand side where you just do that integral explicitly, for instance? Um, you can't do it explicitly because you do not know this function. Yeah? We tried to split off a singular part, kicking a, a regular part that, that never worked. Okay, that just doesn't work. Okay. It just doesn't work, yeah. But I, I tell you now about the heroes who worked with that. Wrong button. Ah, before I go on, let's assume we have solutions to this equation. How do we get the energy? The energy is given by the derivative or the logarithmic derivative of the product of the eigenvalue functions at different points. 
That takes the explicit form as given here, bulk term. Okay, this prefect that doesn't count. And then we have an integral. G is a number, G is pi over pi minus two gamma, G squared times hyperbolic cosine of GX divided by hyperbolic sine of GX squared, so pole of second order, and then times sum of the logs of the capital A. Uh, you may wonder if this exists, but the logs of capital A have a zero of order L. So for any L larger than or equal to two, this is finite, no problem. And um, the expression for the eigenvalues or for the product of the eigenvalues is given here. So we first derive that, I mean, in the same way we derive expressions for the integral equations, we get the expressions for the, for the, for the log lambda. Okay, so um, in principle, if you know these A1, A2, A3, A4 functions, we know the energy. Yeah, here are the solution functions. Let us, for L equal 10 to the 9. Um, the little a's not only have the of order L at the origin, they are practically zero between them plus or minus log L. So when having a system of size 10 to the 9, then these function little a are zero between, let's say, plus or minus 9 or plus or minus 10. And then, of course, the logarithm of 1 plus little a is also zero. Then there is a transition at these plus and minus log L points or regions, and then the function turns into a plateau behavior, which is given by log two. Here is shown log little a. Log little a has a singularity, a logarithmic singularity at the origin, which you subtract, and the difference takes this form. So also finite, finite values, no problem. So there's you would think there's no problem around. Now we reallocate one beta on this root from the lower to the upper line or vice versa. And then we see that the log of one plus little a functions almost do not change. And for the ground state, all real parts are identical. And there are only two different imaginary parts, seen here in blue and red. Uh, doing the excitation, so then you see four different imaginary parts and two different real parts. So they, I mean, two functions share the same real part and two other functions share the other real part. But the, so to say, the deviation from each other and the deviation from the ground state form is almost negligible. Log of little a is completely different. That shows winding. So it goes starts from plus. 2 pi, the imaginary part is 2 pi, then in this transition region between plus and minus log L, it behaves almost linearly, and then it hits the wall. So it's, so why do I show it to you? I mean, you could think, well, maybe by some simple techniques, one can get rid of the singular kernel, or the singular kernel is, a, uh, well, I mean, some, how to say, I mean, it, 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 it's an artifact or so. No, it has to be there, because, if you write the log little a functions as um, convolutions with this log capital A function, the log capital A functions deviate only a little bit, and the kernel was a, a regular kernel, then also the log little a's on the left hand side would show only little variation, but they show this winding, a huge difference. So if you want some kernel function which, upon convolution to some small function, gives a big result, it has to be a singular kernel, a kernel with uh, increase at large distances and not decrease. So the singular kernel makes sense. Uh, here I showed again the, um, um, the real parts. Now for the case of log capital A1 for the ground state and for the excited state. The ground state is shown in black, the excited state in brown. Um, these are the real parts. The imaginary parts are red or violet. So they're pretty close to each other. Now, what has been done in such a context? So, uh, my claim or theorem is all of us, Kandu Iklev, also Fram and Seel, and what I'm presenting here is about the same functions and equivalent equations, but written down in a different way. Kandu and Iklev solved practically 
the set of nonlinear integral equations, maybe they, they shifted the, line, the contours where they uh, use the functions. Uh, but they work with a singular kernel. I cannot tell you much about the techniques they, they use. It's rather difficult. And I think they apply it to a system of size 10 to the 2 only. I, I, I read the articles in that number I found. Fram and Seher use different functions. They do not, well, what, what they start with are closed contour integrals. But the closed contour integrals use functions which are related to those I am using in this way. Instead of what I call little a, they look at 1 over a. So in practice, they take the function uh, little a and use it on four different lines without changing it, or maybe changing them in a different way. So why is this transition from little a to 1 over a, in a sense, redundant, or leads to the same equations? Because log of little a is minus log of little a tilde. Log of capital A, which is log of 1 plus little a, which is log of 1 plus 1 over li little a tilde, is, of course, log of a tilde, capital A tilde minus log of little a tilde. So it means when you take this renaming of the function, insert it, you get equivalent equations. And then, of course, um, everything is reformulated such that the log little a is log a tilde on the left-hand side and the log capital A, log capital A. Uh, tilde on the right hand side. So the, the difference is really only in organizing of what is on the left and what is on the right hand side. What do we do? We found the following super great manipulation. The super great manipulation starts with little a. Little a is uh, the uh, shorthand for log little a1 to a2, a3, etc. equal to d plus kernel, the singular kernel, convolution with capital A. Then, um, just for convenience, so the, the first step is we subtract little d from, the right, from, from right to left. Mm -hmm. And then we multiply with 2. Then we get 2 times little a minus d equal a star. Convolution is 2 times capital A. Trivial. Then we subtract and add the same term. Later, I have to tell you why we do that. I mean, I'm doing trivial manipulations. Then we take this term to the left hand side, and then we get a 2 minus capital K applied to A minus little d. On the right hand side is left only K star 2 capital A minus uh, little a minus d. Then we divide by 2 minus K, and then we get, and then we put d back to the right, and we get A equal d plus this ratio, which I call KR, star little a minus d minus 2 times capital A. I call it KR because this is regular and it's shown here. It has again the same block structure as before, but now the prefactors are absolutely regular functions. Uh, they are ratios of hyperbolic signs, and that means for K to zero, there's no problem. Um, also for K to plus or minus infinity, there's no problem. It goes to zero. Now, <coughs> two remarks. Why is this form Good. I mean, first of all, the kernel is regular. Second, little a minus little d is free of this singularity to the high order zero at the origin. And then we have minus 2 capital A. Why do I manipulate it such that a minus little d minus 2 times capital A and not minus 1 times capital A appears? That is done for making sure that this difference has fast asymptotics to zero for x to plus and minus infinity. One can prove that. Second remark, this kernel k regular is slightly dangerous because for the, so when doing iterative solutions of that, I mean, we, we just put in into the right some ansatz, then we calculate the convolution, then we get out little a, then we insert it uh, on the right, little a is just reproduced, capital A has to be calculated from little a and we, we repeat it. Then it may be, well, the problem that may appear is if this uh, operation is not contracting. And uh, there is a slight danger. The danger is always largest for the k equal to zero mode. For the k equal to zero mode, this kr, this uh, kernel, has um, one eigenvalue identical to plus one, and then two times eigenvalue zero 
and uh, a last eigenvalue close to zero. The eigenvalue of plus one comes with an eigenstate of, the, of, of this form, one minus one, one minus one. And one can understand that this is never an instability of the system. Okay. Um, uh, okay, I, I showed the equation, but for, for using them and getting high quality numerical data, one has to massage them a little bit more. I think there are only one or two people in the audience who are really interested in that. But for those, here it is. Um, when um, doing this reallocation of beta roots and having functions a little a showing this winding, little a's are lots of little, but this here, little a1, and um, these wind, or let's say the asymptotics on the left and on the right are different. Then the convolution is still defined, but for doing it numerically, it's much better to subtract this winding in the function we want to insert into the car. And for that, we choose the logarithm, some logarithm of a hyperbolic tangent function. Then we have to add the term k, contribution with this w tilde, and then we get something I call here w. And the w's uh, are shown here. Um, so in this form, what I have to do num numerically is something which is absolutely well defined and should give high accuracy and calculation. If you, if, if you do not do that, you see disasters when doing Fourier transform. I, so I'm not doing the convolutions according to definition. I do the, doing the convolution Fourier space. Yeah, so numerically, I, I, I take the numerical data, then I Fourier transform them, then I get the Fourier coefficients, I multiply in Fourier space, and then I do the numerical Fourier transform back. <laughs> OK, and here are actually numbers. So um, we calculate these function little a. We plug them in into this integral, do the integral, and then we compare with this formula. And um, we do it here for L equal to 10, 10 to the 2, 10 to the 3, up to 10 to the 15, for um, 16,384 grid points, and also for 32,768 grid points. And the computation for this number of grid points for 1,000 iterations takes only 40 seconds by use of photon 77 and my WPTN153, which is uh, something with an Intel i7 processor with 2.4 gigahertz. I have actually eight inside, but only one is used. And the numerical S accuracy is 16 decimals. So we do the calculation and we compare with results by Bajanov, Kotosov, Koval, Lukyanov, who had uh, used ODE IQFT or IM correspondence, and they obtain the following quantization condition for S. It's written here. S appears in this equation. S is here, there, and there. On the right hand side, there is a winding number, little n. And the system size is here. Roughly speaking, the leading term is this term, and you can forget about that. Here you see 4S times log of L is equal to n times 2 pi. That's what I showed you in the beginning. Now, we use n equal 1, gamma equal 0 0.8, and we get <coughs> these numbers. Well, um, in the first row, you see the system size. In the second row, you see the result for this bracket, plus 1 over 6, from the nonlinear integral equation. And in the lower row, you see the results by uh, BKKL. For two sides, there's no coincidence, except the zero in front of the decimal. Yes. For 10, we have an agreement of three digits. For 10 to the 2, let's say four digits, or three non-trivial digits. 10 to the 3, uh, I think these are six or so digits. 10 to the 6, well, eight or so. And uh, so what is uh, shown here in fact, um, or boldface, that's the agreement. 10 to the 9, well, now the agreement decreases, 10 to the 12, it decreases further, and 10 to the 15, it decreases again. So what is the consequence of that? We, I mean, we set out to chase Bajanov and company, and uh, we caught up with them for the system size 10 to the 6. But then I think it's our numerics. 
which is suffering. I mean, their uh, asymptotic formula must be correct. Yeah. So, so that's how many digits do you compute on? 16 digits. I Maybe could, that's sorry? Maybe that's bad somehow. Yeah, I think so. That might be too bad. Uh, so, I mean, yeah. You can work with precise mathematics, probably here you can do. You can do as many digits as you like, so probably we will. Uh, have mathematics has been slow. So, what I want to do next time, whenever I have time, I, I look around where there is a machine with 128 bits or something. And then no, use CLN. It is for CLN. CLN. Maybe. So, does it work uh, with Fortran? And Fortran? I use Fortran. <laughs> no, but it's fully compatible with C++. <laughs> uh, I will be looking for a, a computer with only 28 bits, and then it will be solved for me. <laughs> okay, I mean, a, 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 a trivial joke from my side. I mean, don't use the Bajanov company's formula for L equal to. Yeah, so that's pretty bad. Then. Okay. So, so um, yeah. is there any data on that uh, meaning of that formula, quantization condition? It looks like the logarithm of a beta. So. Well, I can derive the, f the first part, the leading part, no more. Um, I can produce what has been produced by Wiener Hopf in a cheap way without solving anything. I will show in a, in a minute, so to say, um, something like that. Um, yeah. Usually, the results we get by numerics are absolutely correct. Forget about the, the accuracy issue of, of numerical calculations. Yeah? Um, and for short and large system sizes, we can calculate accurately. When it's about extracting asymptotic formulas, so to say analytical formulas for the asymptotes, then although everything is in the in nonlinear integral equation, it's difficult to get it out, except for the leading terms, which I will show. Okay, first some remarks on the accuracy. So the question is maybe uh, the kernel is still bad, the solutions run away, maybe I did not use a sufficiently large interval, maybe I did not use sufficiently many grid points, I tried everything and it never changed. Now to give you an idea about what the functions look like that enter in the numerical computation, they are shown here. So a minus b minus n, n equal one times w till minus two a, for n equal 10 to the 9 and 10 to the 12 are shown here. Okay, you see the same structure on the left and right, and what happens with increasing system sizes, this will be stretched. So uh, the log L goes, goes from minus 10 to plus 10 for 10 to the 9, and maybe from minus 14 or something to plus 14 for 10 to the 12. Then when you're doing that for 10 to the 15, then you see this um, tendency uh, developing further, but you also see wiggles. Now you could, as I said, you could think, I mean, everything is unstable. But here I show the difference of left hand side and right hand side after 1,000 iterations. You see a lot of noise, but look at the amplitude. It's 5 times 10 to the minus 16. So the equation is satisfied. Now, how do we get the leading? 1 over L and the leading 1 over L log L square correction, analytically. For that, we use the singular kernel formulation. We take the differentiated version, so here it's written a bit more explicit, so there's an internal sum in the kernel by the log of 2 to the log of 1 plus little a. On the left-hand side, I take the derivative of the only term that is there. On the right hand side, I take the derivative of the first term, and then in the convolution, I take the derivative of the kernel. Then the singular nature is softened. So instead of a 1 over k square behavior, we have 1 over k. And 1 over k means this kernel, the differentiated kernel, only varies from one asymptotic value to another constant asymptotic value. Then we multiply with the log of 1 plus little a1, the same argument, sum over a, takes the interval from 0 to infinity. Not from minus infinity to plus infinity, from 0 to infinity. Then on the right hand side, we get the obvious terms, where, um, yeah, so here we have a double integral. 
the inner integration is still from minus infinity to plus infinity. Here, the y integral of appearing in this product gives you evolution. And the x integral is from zero to infinity. Now, what, what can we observe? The left-hand side, that can be evaluated analytically because that's a complete differential order. When, when we change the variable of integration from x to ai, then here is written the integral of log of 1 plus a divided by a dA. This is a dialog integral, and the left-hand side gives an explicit pi square over 3. On the right-hand side, the first term, up to um, algebraic corrections and 1 over L, is the energy we are interested in. I leave it as it is. And the second term can be massaged. The second term is an integral from 0 to plus infinity and an integral from minus infinity to plus infinity. I write it in this way. A double integral from 0 to infinity, and here double integral, one variable from 0 to infinity and the other one from minus infinity to 0. Now, by the symmetry of k, or the anti-symmetry of k prime, namely, when you interchange the indices and you interchange the arguments in this function, you get the same as before times a minus sign. By that property, the first double integral is zero. Only the second double integral remains. In the second double integral, the difference of the arguments x and y only counts for large values. So in, in that case, we can use the limiting behavior. And this is just this constant times plus minus signs. So the second double integral takes this form. And you see there's no interesting kernel left. A product of two logs with arguments, logs of 1 plus a i and a j, with arguments x and y, it completely decouples. And then you see it's a, it's a square, absolute value square, of a basic integral. The basic integral mm -hmm. is the integral of the logarithm of this ratio. This is the alternating sum of the logs of capital A's and the integral from zero to infinity. A similar integral from minus infinity to zero gives minus i. Now, the result is given here. The question is, what is capital A? I, I, what is capital I? The integral. We look, it's a nonlinear integral equation for log of, for instance, A1 in the plus infinity and minus infinity. The difference has to be two pi i times the number n. That's what we know. By use of the integral equations and, and looking at them, we see we get a number times, um, okay, then a factor 2 log L appears, and this integral. So what I want to say is you, you do a similar analysis and you do the obvious calculation and you see the same combination appearing again and, and this integral. So from this, you calculate capital I, then you insert here and you get this. So what I showed you is, in this equation, the term on the left-hand side gives the conformal weight, the, the leading 1 over L term. The, the first term on the right-hand side is actually this energy term. I mean, that, that's the term we are interested in. So it consists of the left-hand side minus the second term on the right-hand side. The second term on the right-hand side is this term. So I calculated these two terms, in, including the logarithmic corrections, without ever solving the nonlinear integral equations. It comes for free, so no Wiener Hopf, et cetera, is necessary. So this is the use of the nonlinear integral equation in the singular kernel version. In the regular kernel version, one can calculate for all system sizes up to numerical accuracy, and uh, the singular part gives us these correction terms. Now I have five minutes left, I think. Including discussion. Okay. So, 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 sorry. Uh, yeah. Did you manage to get the gamma functions? No. The you, so you're safe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> your, your result is. No, no, I, I mean, I mean the the one the simple ones, not the one that depend on uh, S. The one that uh, go into the. the uh, yeah, okay. the non-universal one. This. Uh, yeah. These gamma square root of pi, gamma one plus. Yeah, this one. Maybe I have to massage a bit more. I uh, so far no. I mean, it's uh, also about the question of, yeah, it's zero, yeah, the inherent length. Uh, yeah, thanks for the, 
for this suggestion. So far, no. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, what is the magnitude of the terms you neglect like when you uh, expanded the kernel for large separation? <laughs> You want to know something like, um, in comparison to log L, if it's uh, order one or some, or maybe a power of one, one well, over some. See if, if you expand the kernel one order further. Um, we did the basic calculations only so far. I mean, then we were attracted by another problem. The problem I'm not allowed to show due to time limitations. I just want to remind. Oops, no. So. I just want to say SL2 slash one supersymmetric free free bar model. Here we have two types of beta roots U and gamma sub J sub alpha. Range distribution in complex plane. We managed to get two versions of nonlinear integral equations. This is the one with singular kernel. There's a regular part and a singular part. There you see one over hyperbolic sine of k absolute value enters. You think, well, that's maybe not so bad. It's better than the one before, but still, I don't like it. And there is a regular version when you massage everything and you keep some little A's and capital A on the left hand side, capital A's on the right hand side, but you mix into it little A's. Then the kernels that appear are strictly regular. And still, still, because now, not only the kernel was problematic, but also the functions are similar. So what is called log of some little B or A function has now um, um, asymptotes which go to minus infinity for plus, for x to plus and minus infinity. The log of one plus C or log of capital C also goes to plus and minus infinity. So it's much harder. Okay, one result we got. I will summarize it in, in this summary. Uh, I showed to you a quick derivation of nonlinear integral equations. We have now an understanding of all the inter nonlinear integral equations that are around. Uh, the transformation to a regular version uh, was possible and has been used for numerics. Asymptotics are obtained from the, in an analytical way from the singular version. And for the 3 3 bar model, this is SL2 slash 1 symmetry, we managed to identify that the leading finite size corrections are indeed of order 1 over log L. That was not so clear from the numerics, I think. And um, yeah, what is left to do, increase the numerics for the staggered six vertex model and to treat the 3 3 bar model completely uh, in parallel to the results of the staggered six vertex model. So that's everything I wanted to tell you. Thank you very much for your attention. For example, uh, in the ODE IQFT correspondence, in the quantization conditions, you are able also to treat uh, descendant states. Descendant states. Okay. Right? Yeah. Uh, this is not possible in this approach, right? In this approach, oh. in the so we can extend that. I'm absolutely sure we didn't do it. So the, okay. the difficult part is what we then do. Descendants and let's say introduce non zero M, non zero W. Uh, that's Identifying the additional zeros of the eigenvalue function and then taking those zeros into account. I did it for some other models before. I'm pretty sure I can do it here if I wanted. You said non-zero m and non-zero w, or what about non-zero integer? The, the integer. Yeah, also, also that should be right. Okay. Yeah. So maybe it's more like a comment. In the singe Gordon theory, if you go to the that is a TBA equation what could be derived from the lattice. And this was done by Jörg Teschner. Uh, I'm not here anymore. He could comment on this. So, so you have a single TB equation. And if you go to very, very small volume, then you can recover the Liouville reflection equation, which is very similar to what actually you, you, you showed here, uh, analytically. So he could, uh, what was it? Was it I mean, from the TBA, the he would get a similar equation analytically. Analytically, I see. Using all the IM correspondence. And that's in his paper? Or, yes, yeah. yes. Okay. Thank you. Yes. You computed the 1 over L and 1 over L log L corrections. Is it easy to go to the next one? Uh, um, I would say 
probably no, I mean, maybe at some point you have to solve these nonlinear integral equations also for the asymptotics, yeah, you see. I, uh, I presented what can be done just uh, by using the equations and the asymptotic behavior of the solution function. So if you need uh, detailed information about these uh, functions, then that's a different story. More questions? Maybe one question. Ah, that's right. That's right. Oh, yeah. 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 Also, a generalization to open models? Is it also possible? It's open boundary condition, etc. Um, I would think it's possible, but I have not looked at it. I hope so. I have a question with respect to the SL21 model. That's the isotropic case, yeah? That's the isotropic one, yes. yes. And uh, I mean, that has this very peculiar root configuration for the ground state. This one. Any problem? Where all the roots collapse? Um, the ground set I can show to you. Thank you for giving me additional time. <laughs> um, the collapse is <laughs> by having this twist angle phi different from pi. I okay. introduced it before. Here are results for phi different from but close to pi. Then you see. Um, so it, Phi equal pi is a little, so this is a ring, well, different names, yeah? Okay, so on, on the left hand side, logs of zeros appear, it's ugly. And on the right hand side, logs of this capital C also zero appear. So, I mean, that's what is called collapse, etc. and that's what we observe. But for finite, well, for phi different from pi, here you see results for the log of cap, log of capital C. Only, so, um, black line means phi is far away from pi. The green line is closer. Let me see. Um, you get normal behavior of these functions for phi different from pi. And if you approach pi, then this goes to minus infinity, the entire line. Yeah? So the asymptotes sl more slowly than the inner part. And on, on, on the left hand side, the log of little b. So um, capital B equal 1, therefore log of capital B equal 0 is also approached. You see the black line is different from zero, and then the red line is closer, and the green line is practically on the, on the real axis. So the behavior we expect is, is in the equations. And, the, and we don't, well, if you now ask the question, how do these roots now behave from phi less than pi to phi equal to pi? Uh, I think I never looked at that in detail. Yeah, so. But everything- I'm not asking any further. <laughs> <laughs> Are there more questions? <laughs> is it possible to understand in the physical terms the appearance of this one of the log L corrections? Oh, Let's say so. a, a particular configuration of the beta root, something which you could interpret in physical terms. So um, one over log corrections can appear due to several reasons. So maybe in some context where people study non-unitary systems, the logs appear naturally. Uh, logs appear when there are marginal operators in the system. For instance, the isotopic spin one half Heisenberg chain, there are also logs appear, and those logs are one over um, similar and different from these here. And, and these logs, well, they, they look like those that appear in nonlinear, I mean, these lead to the density of states of certain nonlinear sigma models in uh, black hole geometries. That's what uh, has been uh, reminded us of uh, by Sasha German, and then the, the question was whether it's a Euclidean or a Lorentzian black hole. I do not understand anything about that. Mm -hmm. So in different contexts, these logarithmic corrections can appear. And the best understood from, uh, what I do understand best is the case with the normalization group language with marginal operators, etc. That That one can, I, I managed to understand. Uh, well, the reason why I'm asking, because uh, Similar kind of the log, log appear completely different uh, context. Namely, thinking about uh, uh, <coughs> spin chains, but non-compact one yeah, for yeah. for SL2 spin chain. But then you go to the limit when your size L is finite, but the spin of your the system is large. Yeah. And there you have. If it, now if you look for the structure of the ground states and excitation, then you have exactly the same corrections. You go on one of the logs of the speed, not the log, yeah, log of the system. Yeah. And such kind of crashes have been understood from point of view of DCFT, etc. Yeah, yeah. yeah, thank you for this, um, for this suggestion. Right? Yeah.
Okay, so I think we should send it to the end.